So we are live. Wait just a second for the settings to move around. Okay. And everybody is slowly coming across. Just another couple moments. Let the uh, let people move in from the other session tab. And that's probably that's probably long enough. So yes, hello and welcome to the final talk of the day. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, uh, to present to you guys, introduce to you. Uh, Interdisciplinary team of, uh, of uh, Modi Mizrahi from Florida Tech and Michael Dickinson from the University of Illinois. And they are going to be walking us through philosophical reasoning about science, a quantitative digital study. So I'm really excited to see, uh, see what you guys have for us. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Charles and uh, Luca as well for uh, organizing this, this great conference. Uh, I've been amazed by the, the work that people are doing uh, and what I've seen so far. And I'm ashamed to say that we don't have fancy visualizations for you. Uh, so for, forgive us uh, for that. Um, but we are definitely happy that Charles and Luca have organized this kind of conference because we've had in philosophy at least this kind of experimental turn in the beginning of the millennium uh, and so uh, maybe it's time for a digital turn, right? And the use of more computational and corpus-based uh, methods in, in philosophy. And I definitely think that that's uh, long overdue. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, philosophical reasoning uh, about science. So it's kind of a, Meta Philosophy of Science uh, project. And uh, we started thinking about that because if you open any uh, book on philosophy of science, introductory books like Samir Akasha's Philosophy of Science, then you'll see philosophers of science saying that induction is, you know, at the foundation of, uh, of science, right? Um, Okasha even points out that, you know, for most philosophers, it's obvious that science relies heavily on induction and you don't even need to argue for it. Uh, it's, it's that obvious. Um, if you look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as well, uh, in several entries about philosophy of science, about scientific realism, about the problem of induction like this one, then you will see the same kind of sentiment being expressed that uh, we rely on inductive reasoning, not just in everyday life, but in science as well. And uh, it's at the foundation of the, the scientific method. So, um, and then uh, in a kind of related study that I did before, uh, this one, I looked at uh, the, um, way in which scientists talk about confirmation and hypothesis testing in uh, scientific journals. And my findings, also I looked at, uh, it was a corpus-based study and uh, the findings suggested that, yes, there's mostly an emphasis on this kind of inductive talk when they talk about confirmation and hypothesis testing. But interestingly, it's not, uh, in all the sciences, it's mostly in the life and social sciences, not so much in the physical sciences. Uh, but that's a different project. For today, we would like to focus on philosophy of science itself and ask the question of whether inductive inference is as much at the foundation of philosophy of science as it is supposed to be the foundation of science. So do those who study science, namely philosophers of science in particular, rely on inductive, inductive reasoning as much as the people that they study supposedly uh, do? Uh, so these are the questions that we were uh, interested in. And uh, we, uh, the corpus that we have is, is from JSTOR. 
And in particular, it consists of articles from the following journals. Uh, British Journal of Philosophy of Science, of course, is a flagship journal in, in philosophy of science. Uh, and we also have uh, the other flagship journal, Philosophy of Science uh, itself. Uh, and in addition to that, we have uh, these journals uh, as well, all of which publish, of course, articles in uh, philosophy of science, some of which in uh, history uh, and philosophy of science as well, uh, and some of them also in the history of philosophy of science. Uh, so it's um, kind of a broad spectrum of what the discipline of philosophy of science uh, looks like, at least as far as um, journal publications are, are concerned. Now, what's nice about studying reasoning and arguments in corpus is that in philosophy, you have a fairly established way of doing that. Namely, uh, if you look at any logic textbooks uh, or any uh, introduction to logic or critical thinking or introduction to reasoning, uh, these textbooks will tell you that the way to find arguments in text is to look for indicator words or uh, markers of uh, uh, arguments, right? We heard some of that today from, uh, from one of the keynote speakers. Uh, about markers of, uh, of arguments in, in texts, right? So that's a fairly established way of doing that as far as uh, logic, critical thinking, argumentation is concerned, right? So these are just two examples from logic textbooks, right? Where the authors talk about indicator words like therefore, since, because, right? If you see these words in a text, you know that uh, probably, right, of course, this is not a foolproof method of finding arguments, uh, but probably there's an argument there uh, being made in the text. And similarly, in this uh, introduction to informal logic, the authors say that the word therefore is a conclusion marker or conclusion indicator. Uh, and then you have reason markers or uh, premise indicators, words like since and, and so on. Right? So uh, if that's the way to find arguments in any text, then of course, that's the way to find arguments in, uh, in uh, journal publications as well, in articles, right? So that's exactly what we did. We uh, took these indicator words uh, and uh, uh, divided them into these uh, uh, types of arguments, right? So for uh, abductive arguments or explanatory arguments or inferences to the best explanation, we have indicators like uh, best explain, of course, the best explanation for, and so on. For deductive arguments, we have words like absolutely, certainly, definitely, and so on. And for inductive arguments, we have indicators like uh, likely, probably, and, and so on. And here you have some examples from philosophical texts of how these uh, indicators are used uh, in the context of, uh, of an argument that's being made. And so we took these indicators for argument types and we paired them with uh, general indicators for arguments, right? The argument markers that we saw before, words like therefore, hence, uh, it follows, uh, we can infer that, and, and so on and so forth. So when you combine a, an indicator for an argument type, like abductive, deductive, or inductive, with an argument indicator, words like therefore, and hence, and so on, right, you get these indicator pairs that will uh, identify in a, in a corpus, right? Not only uh, that there's an argument being made, but also what kind of argument is it? Is it deductive, inductive, or abductive, right? So this combination of indicator pairs gives you 36 indicator pairs per argument type, right? So 36 for abductive arguments, 36 for deductive arguments, and 36 for inductive arguments. 
And the other thing we did is to conduct these kinds of searches in our corpus uh, by um, with with different um, uh, different length between those indicators, right? So in uh, one kind of search, we did uh, three words between a, a, an argument type indicator and an argument indicator, right? So for example, if we're searching for therefore and best explain, right? You could have three words between these two uh, indicators, right? And uh, you're gonna get a hit if there are three or less words between these two indicators. And we did the same thing with six words uh, and, and 10 words between uh, the two uh, indicators, right? So um, this method uh, is something that I, I have used already in another uh, article that was published in Metaphilosophy where with my co-author uh, Zoe Ashton, we looked at this idea that philosophy is a priori, right? It's a discipline that requires abstract thought that you can do from the armchair, right? So uh, we used a similar methodology to find out that, uh, you know, if philosophy is indeed an a priori discipline, then we should find more deductive arguments being made uh, in, in philosophical journals rather than abductive or, or inductive arguments, right? Uh, so this method has been used before, but for this particular uh, study, uh, we have sort of scaled up the method significantly. And so to explain that further, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mike, who has really been doing all the hard work. So he's gonna explain a little bit more about our methodology. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just wanna say thanks for listening today. Um, I, I am uh, formerly a data librarian, and I did work with Modi at Florida Tech uh, before leaving for the University of Illinois. So that's how this collaboration came about. Uh, and without further ado, I, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our text mining methods. Uh, so the first, um, the first tool, that, the main tool that I would say we used is the R language in conjunction with RStudio, which is a graphical user interface. Uh, which enables us to use R easily. Um, we also used a sort of a language within a language, which are known as regular expressions. Regular expressions allow us to specify really interesting and diverse patterns when searching through text. Uh, and finally, we did a little bit of work in the Windows command prompt. I also do want to mention the, uh, the main packages we used, which are in R, which are stringer, dplyr, and read text. And all of these are pretty famous packages and pretty straightforward to use uh, once, you, once you start learning. Uh, and now I would like to, before I go into the methods, I'd like to say just a little bit about the documents in our corpus, if you could advance the slide. Uh, so we, uh, we're working with a pretty large corpus of philosophical articles and book chapters um, with approximately 435,000 full text articles and chapters uh, taken from JSTOR. Uh, and then with those full text articles uh, come an XML file, which contains the corresponding metadata to each full text article. Uh, and next, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about how we go about importing 435,000 uh, and ultimately close to 900 uh, and 50,000 articles all at once. And that is with the read text uh, function, uh, which it comes from the read text package. And all you have to do is specify an object equals uh, um, read text and then input the folder path. And the read text function will uh, navigate to that directory or folder and, uh, and essentially input uh, or load in all of the contents of that directory. Uh, when, when it appears and it's finally finished in R, it creates a data frame with two columns. Uh, the first column is the doc ID column, which is a unique identifier for the column, but it's, it can also be the file name. Uh, and then the text column is a single character string, a single character string for each article. 
um, which uh, contains the full text of that article. And when you have multiple items in the folder, it will create uh, a string vector. So uh, that you have a single data frame with two columns and each row contains the full text of that article. Uh, I will note that it does take quite a while to load that in and to search uh, on a specific pattern. When you're dealing with 435,000 documents, uh, it could I would hit run in R on my local machine and it would take about 30 minutes. I did move to a newer machine with a solid state drive and that cut the time down to about 20 minutes each time we would run or load the data in, but uh, it is worth noting that it does put a heavy load on, on a local machine. Um, and now moving on, I'll talk about how we would search for a specific pattern. So we would use the string detect function out of the stringer package. And with string detect, you input the string vector that you're looking uh, for a pattern in, and then the specific pattern uh, or a regular expression. And we'll talk in a moment about regular expressions. Um, it's also important to note that uh, this uh, function will ignore punctuation. So as you can see in the example, we have the sentence, this new revelation definitely proves Hume's argument. Uh, and if we use string detect on the string and look for proves, that'll return true. I will note that uh, if we used argument and just look for the term argument, it would return true as well, uh, even though there is the period at the end there, it will ignore that punctuation. Uh, and we can move to the next slide, please, Moby. And so we used a regular expression in our research because we were trying to specify a really specific pattern. So uh, in place of the pattern, we do use the rejects command, which is an R function. Uh, and rejects, regular expressions are sort of a language within a language. Uh, they're actually pretty tricky to use. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see I used rejectser, which is a tool online, which helps you build uh, regular expressions. I've actually never met anyone who's so good at using regular expressions that they can just write them uh, on their own. I think everybody pretty much has to use a tool like this, but I can tell you a little bit about what this does uh, without telling you every detail. Uh, and you can see our indicator pair in the expression. In this example, we have proves, and then we have probably, uh, and then you have that the brackets that specify zero and six, so what we're essentially looking for here are the terms uh, proves and then the term probably, and they can be within six words of each other. Uh, and then when we're searching across 10 word range or three word range, we change that six to a 10 or a three. Uh, you'll notice in the middle, there's this bar and then probably uh, starts again. And it's essentially the same expression backwards. And what that indicates is that the regular expression does not place any preference on the order that the terms come in. Uh, so probably could come within six words before proves or proves can come within six words before probably. Uh, and with that, we're going to move on and talk a little bit about how we uh, converted this to numeric data. So uh, once we have searched for the pattern, it will string detect will return the list of logicals representing true if the pattern is present and false if the pattern is absent. So then we just use the string replace command, which is also in the stringer package to replace uh, the true values with one and false with zero. Uh, it is important to note that that will still be a character vector. So we do have to convert that to a numeric vector which we use as numeric. Uh, from there, we can sum the total matches and uh, that will yield the count of total matches for each indicator pair uh, across each word range. Uh, and we can move on. And there is uh, more that we did, uh, and I'm just kind of gonna go through this a little more quickly. Uh, so it's also important to note that while we generated that count data, we also took the matched articles from the the full master corpus and uh, created our own separate CSVs and data sets for them. Um, so we were able to do this by taking those true logicals and binding them back with the data frame uh, and then filtering for uh, true in the logicals list uh, vector that has been attached to the data frame. 
you can see how we did that with the filter command here. And that is from the dplyr package. Uh, dplyr is really great for cutting up and manipulating and, and filtering data. Um, and it's definitely an, an essential package to use if you're using R. Um, from there, we did save those CSVs, as I mentioned. We had to then import all of those CSVs and bind them by word range, and then add the argument type in a new column so that all of the deductive indicators uh, were labeled as being deductive indicators and all the indu inductive and so on. Uh, and, then, and what that ultimately results in are three master data sets, one for each word range, three words, six words, and 10 words. Uh, and those data sets contain the document ID and the full text like they did before, uh, but it also contains the argument type. And once we have the argument type, we are able to extract our metadata and we can proceed, Modi. Uh, oh, I will note a couple of, uh, a note and a limitation of this, uh, of this approach. So uh, because of the way this, the, um, that we approached this, uh, it is possible that a single article can be counted in our list of, uh, of matched articles more than once. As you can see with this example, uh, if an article contains the terms follows and absolutely, as well as hence and definitely, and both are within 10 words of each other, that article would appear twice in the list of 10 word uh, matches. Uh, it's also important to note the, the only really serious limitation of string detect, and that is that string detect will only tell us the presence of a pattern one time per article. Uh, so say if uh, follows, uh, follows and absolutely were to appear more than once in a single article, uh, our, our approach was not able to count that. Uh, and once we have uh, that master data set with the full text and uh, the metadata attached we, um, and the argument type attached, we are able to uh, attach our metadata by joining using a simple left join command. Uh, this is where that doc ID column becomes really important because the metadata documents have the same uh, file name, which then is translated to doc ID by read text. So that is how we're able to join and connect the appropriate metadata file to the appropriate full text file. Uh, in order to do this, I did use a, a simple command in Windows command prompt and that is the star rename, and then you can put the file type you're starting with, and then the file type that you're converting to, which in this case was text files. It is possible, I will note, to, uh, to work with metadata and XML directly in R. I just think it's uh, personally a, a little more difficult to interpret your results and what you're working with. It's a lot easier to read what's happening when you just convert to text. Uh, and if you could advance the slide, Moody. Uh, so in order to extract the specific metadata that we needed, we had to I identify the specific tags. And in this case, it was the journal title tag. Um, and if you haven't ever used XML, uh, every XML is uh, a bunch of little containers for different pieces of information about uh, any kind of work. So in this case, the journal title tag is that container. And we used another regular expression to extract the information between, to locate that container and then extract the information from it using the string extract command, which is also from the stringer package. Uh, as you can see here, we have specified, um, you can see just the, uh, the greater than sign on one side and then the parentheses containing the period star and question mark, and, then, uh, and that is the end of the start tag. And then you can see more specifically the end of the end tag so that we were able to specify the right parts to pull data from. And this uh, could be done on just about any piece of metadata that you want. We did do it, uh, perform this technique on other pieces of metadata, uh, like the date and the author name and things like that. But uh, for this study, we really needed to focus on the journal title. Uh, once we have those titles extracted, we can then bind them back to the uh, corpus again. And from there, we are able to filter down to the specific 
uh, the specific journals that we have been working with. And I believe that's it for me. So I'm gonna let Modi take over again. Thanks everybody. All right, thank you, Mike. So as you can see, uh, I was right. Mike was doing all the hard work. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, tell you about the results of the uh, study. And as Mike uh, pointed out, right, we have three uh, data sets, right? One for our three word searches, one for six word searches, and one for 10 word searches. And we basically found the same patterns in all of them, but as you can expect, right, for the three word searches, we have less hits, right, than for the six uh, word searches and, and for the 10, right? So what you can see here is the proportion of argument types by uh, journals, right? So you see that uh, in some journals, right, like uh, the British Journal for Philosophy of Science, right, there are more deductive arguments than other types, but for others like Opus and um, uh, PSA, right, we have more inductive arguments than, uh, than uh, deductive arguments and abductive arguments uh, are the, the less frequent uh, type. So we wanted to see if those differences are significant, of course. So we ran some uh, tests. And uh, as far as the BJPS is concerned, the difference between uh, deductive and inductive arguments is uh, significant. Uh, as far as the HPLS is concerned, uh, the difference between inductive and deductive arguments is also significant. Uh, for Hopus, uh, the difference was not significant, and the same applies for the uh, JGPS. Uh, no significant difference between uh, deductive and inductive arguments, although deductive arguments are slightly more frequent than uh, inductive, but the difference is not significant. Uh, for philosophy of science, uh, significantly more inductive arguments than deductive arguments, and for the PSA, uh, significantly more inductive arguments than uh, deductive arguments as well. Of course, in that respect, it's important to note that uh, the uh, PSA uh, papers now appear in philosophy of science as part uh, a part of the the journal, right? So. Um, and I, I don't remember the year exactly where they were joined together, but, uh, but we still looked at uh, earlier PSA papers going back to uh, 1975, I believe, or so. Um, all right, and as I said, in the six word data set, we get uh, a similar pattern, right? Um, again, BJPS, more deductive arguments, but Opus and uh, the PSA and philosophy of science, more inductive arguments. Uh, and again, of course, we wanna know if those differences are significant. So we ran uh, some tests uh, like uh, we did for our three word data set. And again, we got uh, similar results, right? So the, the patterns are the same and the, the results of these physical tests are, are very much the same, right? So again, BJPS, uh, significantly more deductive arguments than inductive arguments. HPLS, again, significantly more inductive arguments than deductive arguments. Uh, HOPUS, significantly more inductive than deductive. No significant differences for the JGPS and philosophy of science. Uh, and for the PSA, significantly more inductive arguments than uh, deductive arguments. And uh, lastly, our 10 word data set. And again, as, as you expect, right, a lot more, the proportions are higher, right? A lot more uh, uh, hits for our search results, but the patterns are pretty much uh, the same. Uh, BJPS again with deductive arguments and uh, the others with uh, inductive uh, arguments and abductive arguments are the less the less frequent uh, type of argument. Right. So again, uh, 
the results of statistical tests are uh, pretty much the same. In the BJPS, deductive arguments are significantly more prevalent than inductive ones. HPLS, again, inductive, more significant than uh, uh, deductive. Uh, HOPUS, uh, again, inductive arguments significantly more frequent than deductive. No uh, significant differences between deductive and inductive arguments as far as the uh, JGPS and the philosophy of science are concerned. And finally, uh, for the PSA papers, uh, inductive arguments are significantly more prevalent than, uh, than deductive arguments. So again, pretty much uh, the same results in our three word, six word, and 10 word data sets. So that shows that you know, the results are pretty robust, right? We get the same patterns in these three uh, data sets. So, uh, so what can we uh, say uh, based on these results? Uh, I think we can say that, yeah, philosophers of science do rely on induction, but it doesn't seem to be as foundational to philosophy of science as it is to uh, science, or at least as it is supposed to be to the science, what philosophers of science tell us that uh, it's supposed to be for, for science, right? So, uh, and that's because of these kinds of mixed results that, that we get, right? Uh, we did find that articles published in HPLS, HOBUS, and the PSA do contain significantly more inductive than deductive arguments overall. But on the other hand, you have the BJPS where you have significantly more deductive arguments than inductive arguments. And as we saw, as far as philosophy of science and uh, JGPS are concerned, there are no significant differences between the proportions of deductive and uh, inductive arguments. So these kinds of mixed results don't support this idea, I think, that um, inductive reasoning is foundational to philosophy of science as it's supposed to be for, uh, for science itself. Another interesting thing about our results, I think, is that uh, abductive arguments or abductive reasoning or inference to the best ex explanation uh, doesn't seem to be all that frequent in, uh, in philosophy of science, right? Uh, even in our 10 uh, word data set, uh, it was roughly less than 10% of articles that contain such, such arguments. So I think that's also interesting and somewhat surprising because in addition to this idea that induction is you know, at the foundation of science, uh, philosophers of science also tend to think that science relies heavily on uh, abductive reasoning as well, right? Um, this is a quote from Anjan uh, Chakravarti, right? He said that, uh, it's ubiquitous in scientific practice. Of course, McMullen has this book, right? That the in, it's the inference that makes science, right? And he's talking about abductive inference uh, in, in particular, right? Uh, so uh, if it is the inference that makes science and it's so ubiquitous in scientific practice, it doesn't seem to be so ubiquitous in philosophy of science, right? Uh, it doesn't seem to be the inference that makes philosophy of science. Um, and so uh, it's maybe pointing to a way in which philosophy of science is different as far as the reasoning uh, is concerned from science and maybe even from everyday reasoning. Uh, because in addition to this idea that explanatory reasoning is uh, foundational to science, or is the inference that makes science, to use McMullen's uh, terminology, um, many philosophers have pointed out uh, that uh, IBE is uh, ubiquitous not only in science, but in everyday life, right? So this is a quote to that effect from uh, a fairly recent uh, collection of essays on in, uh, inferences to the best explanation by McCain and, and Poston. So they say that explanatory reasoning is quite common and it's not only common in science, but it's virtually ubiquitous in everyday life. 
In fact, it's so routine and automatic. Um, that's from uh, Igor Duven's um, uh, SEP entry on abductive reasoning. Uh, it's so routine and automatic that it's uh, it sometimes goes uh, unnoticed, right? So um, again, based on our results, it doesn't seem like uh, explanatory reasoning or inferences to the best explanation are that ubiquitous in uh, in philosophy of science, right? So we think that that's another interesting uh, finding here from from this study. Um, and uh, that's all we have for today. So thank you very much for listening to us. And thank you for inviting us, Charles and, and Luca, to give this talk. Fantastic. So before, there are lots of questions, and I will get to them momentarily. But I do, I, I think you'll be happy to know, uh, your talk has inspired furious discussion in the chat, because now we're all thinking about, okay, that was such a nice, like, demonstration of how we could reproduce an analysis like this on our own. So now we're thinking, okay, do we need like a shared code repository for people who are all interested in this kind of stuff or like a way to aggregate, you know, GitHub repository links or something. So the chat is like bubbling away thinking about like reproducibility and collaboration. So uh, right off, that's completely awesome. Um, let me get, let me get into the questions. Uh, first uh, uh, from Chris Green. Uh, who asks, how many significance tests did you run in total and of which what proportion were successful? Was there any correction for family-wise error or was it all at 0.05? So we, might we have a lot of type one errors turning up as significant here? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we only looked at, um, so that the, 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 the value was 0.05, right? So that's, that's, that was our, threshold. And since uh, it was clear just visually, right, it was clear that abductive arguments are not all that frequent. So we just tested uh, the uh, difference in proportions between deductive and inductive arguments, because that's where, you know, they seem kind of, they, they seem kind of close, right? Um, so, I mean, of course, it's possible, right, that some, uh, such errors, uh, you know, type one errors specifically might uh, sort of creep in. Um, but in some cases, I think, you know, when you, when you, uh, you know, like in the BJPS, for example, right, uh, the results are, are pretty substantial, right, that there's, uh, there's a significant difference there. Great, thanks. Um... Next question, uh, uh, next question coming in uh, from, uh, from Stefan Hesbruggen, who says, so this isn't, a, this isn't a question, but a friendly objection, speaking as a historian of, of philosophy. So HOPOS and HPLS are going to contain a lot of papers in the history of philosophy. And we historians are prone to hedging using expressions like probably a lot, but that doesn't necessarily turn our work into inductions, does it? Good. I mean, that's, that's a very good uh... That's a very good question. So, of course, um, phrases or, or terms like probably, probably, or likely, or, and and so on, can also be used as uh, markers of hedging, right? Uh, so, I think one way to address this, and this is what we did in this study, is to pair uh, these words like probably, probably, and likely, and so on with argument indicators words like therefore, hence, it follows, and, and so on. So of course, it, it might still be the case, you might still get some false positives, right? You might still get some cases where the word probably is being used as a hedge, not as a marker for an inductive argument. That's always, that's always possible. But if you pair it with uh, an argument indicator, like therefore, then that, I think, significantly reduces that, that chance that it's a, you know, it's a hedge, not, not a marker for uh, an, an inductive argument. Nice, nice, thanks. Um, next question from uh, Eugenio Petrovich, who asks, uh, so how can you distinguish argumentative patterns belonging to the philosophical paper from argumentative patterns that the philosophers are reporting on from the scientific studies that they discuss or the historical sources that they cite? 
Yeah, that's uh, that that's a good that's a good question. Uh, and of course, um, we we didn't do that for this study, right? Uh, so if there's a quote from a and Mike probably could talk more about this uh, than I can, but if there is a quote in, in a philosophy of science paper, let's say published in philosophy of science, and there's a long quote from a scientific article that has the, um, you know, the, the um, expression, uh, therefore likely, right, uh, somewhere in there. So that's gonna be counted, right? Um, uh, I don't think that we, we didn't account for that, right? But still, I think that I mean those are going to be quite rare, right? I would I would assume, right? But of course, I need not assume something like that. So, if there's a way, and someone uh, you know can suggest a way to try to you know differentiate between like quotes from a different article within an article, uh, that would be that would be awesome. And uh, maybe Mike, you would like to say something about that too. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you, you pretty much nailed it with, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't consider that. And, uh, it's, it's really interesting to think about, uh, how you would get the machine to be able to identify that because the full text as we receive it is it's a jumbled mess. It's not formatted or anything. So, uh, you know, maybe there's an indication where there, there is a long quote that doesn't have quotation marks around it or something. I've, I don't know how you would exactly be able to look for that kind of a pattern, but uh, uh, like you said, Modi, I'd, I'd be really interested uh, to hear people's ideas. Yeah, in, in, in my experience with JSTOR data, yeah, inline, not even inline quotes with quotation marks are going to be reliable because a quotation mark is a favorite mistake of an o of the OCR process, right? Quotation marks start showing up everywhere that they're not supposed to be. So yeah, no, that it's, it's going to be rough, but it is, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to try to think about. Um, a question coming in from, from uh, Alex Musnuk, who asks, uh, who says, is this a possible alternative explanation for uh, the finding concerning uh, the lack of abductive reasoning? Uh, is there a possibility here that just abduction is just much more hard, uh, difficult to model and capture when we in, 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 in text? And so there's just a, there's a, a difficulty in finding the signal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's possible, right? Uh, if you look at the, um, the phrases that we have used for abductive reasoning, Right, so um, unlike deductive and inductive uh, indicators, which you know th these are unique words, absolutely, certainly, unlikely, and so on, the abductive indicators tend to be at least pairs, if not three words, right? Uh, like makes sense of and best explanation for and, and that sort of thing. So uh, so that I mean that could be one way in which searching for abductive arguments is, is more difficult and more complicated than searching for deductive and, and inductive arguments. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely um, you know, something to, to think about. And again, if people have any ideas, uh, then we, we are certainly open to, uh, to suggestions. Great, thanks. Um... Next question coming in from uh, Christoph Malter, who says, a very inspiring talk, thanks. Uh, did you look at publication years to do a diachronic analysis? So he says, he says, I find the difference between BJPS and philosophy of science somehow puzzling, uh, but it could be explained in a diachronic perspective. If philosophy of science starts in the 30s, where BJPS starts in the 50s, when the discipline was undergoing professionalization. And so maybe their difference has to do with changes in how we write down philosophy. And a way to test this would be to have a, a diachronic view on, on each journal. That, that is an excellent idea. Definitely something to do next. We didn't do it for this talk, obviously, right? Uh, uh, if, if we did, we would, we would present it, but uh, definitely something to do next to look uh, at the timeline and see whether there are changes uh, in the types of arguments being made across uh, the years of publication. Yeah, definitely. 
and we're running out of time, but I, I do, I do want to push this last one in a, in a similar, in a similar spirit of, 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 uh, of, suge- of friendly suggestions. So uh, Eugenio Petrovich also says, uh, uh, says, says, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting to investigate with this method, the role of, of the same inductive, deductive and, and abductive uh, forms of reasoning in other disciplines uh, uh, studying science, like the more empirical ones is so like STS and scientometrics and to try to compare that with philosophy of science. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great suggestion. So thank you. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I think I have to, I, I think I unfortunately have to, to call it there for time because we are, we are over for the day. So thanks very much. Yeah, this, uh, uh, I, I encourage you, by the way, to go look at the, the Crowdcast chat on replay because it's been, it's been, it's been popping off, as they say. Um, so thanks very much for the, uh, for the, for the talk. And uh, we will see everybody back here tomorrow for the final day of, of uh, DS Squared 2021 uh, with another, uh, actually exactly the same schedule as today. So, so looking forward to seeing you all once more tomorrow. Uh, thanks again very much. We'll, uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye.